And you said on CNBC that you felt that the government kind of was doing too much to rescue some of these companies. And you were saying things like you didn't care if the hedge funds got wiped out. And um, I just wondered, you know, so what would that look like if the government were to do what you recommended? And, you know, what you were saying were things like, oh, they wouldn't get to summer in the Hamptons. And who, who would care if they got wiped out? But, you know, I also wondered, like, that sort of applies to... Well, you tell me, maybe it doesn't apply to people like you, but but would you be willing to be wiped out? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've never really been defined um, by my money. I think I was a I was I was an evolutionary person with the same values. I may have been a little more douchey when I was younger or harder to deal with, but um, I was still the same person. And I frankly felt that I had the same worth as a human being when I was growing up on welfare, or when I was in my 20s or 30s or now in my 40s. Um, I think that you know money is a projection that other people use, um, and I used it on myself for a while, and now I use it less. And so, you know, being in a position to actually realize that, you know, the the school teacher that makes sixty thousand dollars is just as important as I am is the truth. Um, and so, yeah, you could take it all away. I don't. I don't really care. It's be a fun ride, no matter what. I think I have a great set of memories that I've created for myself. Um, and the journey has been a blast and I hope to have another 50 year of those things. You know, what I what I was speaking about on CNBC was just my frustration about not wanting to acknowledge where the Federal Reserve and Treasury were not acknowledging how the actual economy works. The United States is an economy where the overwhelming majority of the GDP is generated by consumers. And the way that, you know, consumers lift up the American economy is by spending money. And when you take revenues away from the American consumer because they're unemployed or because they can't earn wages, um, then they're going to spend less, which means that the economy contracts and you have a recession. So first principles thinking would tell you that you put money in the hands of consumers and you put enough money in, in their hands such that the amount that they have exceeds what they need to live and then the excess spending they will spend. And the reason why that's important is then it forces companies to then reopen faster, hire people more. In invariably, what you'll see is then they'll also have to pay them more because again, these consumers have more money, but that's actually all a good rebalancing of what's been happening for the last 40 years, which is that the pendulum has swung. You know, in, in economic theory, you say that the pendulum swings between labor and capital. And in the last 40 years of trickle down economics, what we've really done is swung the pendulum so far towards capital that people who are the labor class don't really have the earning power that they actually had before and putting a lot more money into their hands where effectively you have to pay them more to come back to work isn't a bad thing it will recalibrate what is a very lopsided distribution of leverage and so getting power into the hands of labor and getting more money into the hands of labor actually sort of subverts and sort of puts an end to trickle down economic theory and it kind of worked in the 80s, but frankly, in the 90s and 2000s and, you know, now it just it's it's a dated economic philosophy that doesn't map to how the world works. And you've said that there's room for everyone to have an uncorrelated hedge in their portfolio. And you say that Bitcoin can serve as that. You also have called it schmuck insurance. Um, <laughs> and I wondered, do you think that the coronavirus pandemic is sort of like Bitcoin's moment? Not really. Um, I, I think that um, when I talked about it being schmuck insurance, um, the place that I'm coming from is that uh, we want something that frankly will protect our wealth, however much that it is that we have, in cases where the people in power really get over their ski tips um, and do something that we can all see is a bad idea, but they're driven by short term political incentives. Um, the reality is that, you know, governments used to be run by a very different kind of person. Um, and in some countries today, I would say that, you know, it, it harkens back to how it used to be. So, for example, if you look at Singapore, you know, the smartest people that that graduate um, and, you know, some of the most capable individuals go into the bureaucracy and work for the Singaporean government. I don't think that we could all look at ourselves in the eye and honestly say that that's necessarily true in Western democracies. It's a kind of person that really excels in public relations or, you know, winning elections. It's not necessarily people who excel at governance or legislation. Um, and so the reality is that, you know, we have people that are somewhat mismatched for the job. 
And invariably, whenever that happens, irrespective of whatever profession that is, mistakes happen. Um, you know, I mean, just to use a stark example, it's kind of morbid, but you know, if you put a pilot who's not a great pilot who actually really wanted to be a school teacher in the cockpit of a plane, that person is much more likely to make a mistake um, that has huge consequences than a person who lives and breathes wanting to be a pilot. Um, and that's also true of legislators. Um, and so the reality is that, you know, we have folks that um, will focus on short term window dressing type solutions. Again, you can see it today um, in, in what the in what the Fed and the Treasury are doing. You know, we've massively increased the deficit and the debt. Um, you know, the United States is now the United States government is now responsible for more than 50 percent of the GDP, which essentially makes us a you know quasi communist country, socialist country at a minimum except without any of the benefits. So, you know, you still have sky high healthcare and, you know, exorbitantly high useless education. Um, so it's kind of like the worst form of socialism, uh, dummy socialism. Um, and so, you know, when, when, when those kinds of things are happening and they're not getting fixed and they're only getting exacerbated, I just think that if people have been hard working with their head down, um, they should have an opportunity to make sure that they don't get wiped out if, uh, the government itself just continues to make a string of bad decisions that then have rising consequences. And Bitcoin to me is the only thing that I've seen so far that is really fundamentally uncorrelated to that decision-making process and to that decision-making body. Because at the end of the day, any other asset class, equities, debt, real estate, um, commodities, they're all tightly, tightly coupled to a legislative framework and an interconnectedness in the financial markets that brings together many of the governments that are sort of behaving this way. Um, and so it's almost like a, uh, a bet against uh, the ruling class in some ways and making sure that you have a small amount of insurance because these insurance, again, insurance is not something that pays off 50 cents to the dollar. The insurance is something that pays off, you know, 1000 bucks to a buck. You want these massive, massive asymmetric payoffs um, because you want to be sure that uh, a small amount of insurance can basically make you whole. Um, and that's why I just think that, you know, you should take 1% of your portfolio, put it in Bitcoin, never look at it. Don't look at the price, don't look at anything and hope that that 1% goes to zero. Then you have 99%. Um, but in the case where that 99% goes to zero, that 1% will probably be worth 120% and you'll feel like a genius. But I guess what I'm confused about is, you know, if you feel that the government isn't handling the coronavirus response, I mean, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, handling the stimulus and dealing with the economic fallout in the best way, then why is it that you feel that this wouldn't be the moment when that uncorrelated asset would be something that people could turn to? Um, look, the government has done, you know, uh, depending on how technical you want to get, six or seven forms of quantitative easing since the great financial crisis. So we could have picked any one of those moments and said, this is Bitcoin's moment. And what I'm trying to get across to you is that, you know, it's there. there is no seminal event. And I think that people waiting for a seminal event um, probably create more speculation than is healthy for Bitcoin. Um, I think that, you know, this is a parade of terribles. It's a, it's a bunch of small things that eventually add together, bring down the entire, you know, way in which we think the, the financial infrastructure of the world works. We will lose credibility in it. There will not be a, a single thing, Laura, that you will be able to point to. This will be the sum of many, many bad decisions. Um, and it's the compounding of bad decisions. And, um, you know, historians will try to pinpoint an event and I think it, it'll be not worth the time. I just think that this is in a, it's a pattern. And, um, you know, when you see the pattern, I think you just have to be prepared to hedge it, be on the other side of it, hope the pattern stops. Because quite honestly, if your Bitcoin bet pays off, it will be cataclysmically destructive for the world. Um, and that'll have enormous consequences to many people that we all know and care about who weren't hedged in Bitcoin.